On the one hand, it feels like Christmas advertising and content starts earlier and earlier each year, but on the other hand, we're almost halfway through November and starting to run out of present crafting time. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Good day, friends. Is it time to panic yet? How many days is it until Christmas? If you personally celebrate the season or one of the other holidays conveniently scattered around the solstice per vague Mithraic traditions, you may find yourself in the position of having to give or create presents for others. Today we're going to talk about creative, semi-short notice gifts. Some to give others and a few to put on your own wish list. And I definitely recommend making a wish list. Whether it's through the evil Amazon empire, Bezos land, or post it on a Pinterest board. The important thing is that you can keep a running log of things that might be nice to give or receive and you can keep the web address handy so you can give it to the folks who matter. Seriously, I blank every time mum asks me what I want for Yule. But that's why I have a couple of wish lists and a place she can find fairly easily. It only ever becomes an issue when she thinks I haven't been updating it often enough to give her better options. We're about a month out from the holidays, so here are a few small projects you can make that could conceivably be ready in time for your gift-giving celebration. Pockets, box bags, and totes. We've been all about the pockets over here. The first two I made took a little while to figure out, but the second pocket worked up fairly quickly. It was the embellishment that took some time. Pockets are useful. You can tie it around your waist and use it for crafting the way a handy person might use a tool belt. But instead of a hammer, you're carrying around a tape measure. You don't need to go all out on the fabric either. You can use scraps from past sewing projects, brightly colored novelty cotton, or even pick up an inexpensive fat quarter bundle from your local craft store. If you need a pattern, I have a basic template and instructions for my patrons. You can also find free information and a template from the Victoria and Albert Museum, and there are lots of online sellers. You can find everything from a utility pocket pattern or buy from an Etsy seller like Sosteen who makes pre-embroidered pocket fronts that you could use for your own creation. Just remember to order ASAP so you can get your project finished on time. Box bags are another way to use up scrap fabric, novelty, and quilting cotton. If you have a knitter or a crocheter on your recipient list, they might enjoy a custom box bag particularly if your gift features their favorite fandom or extra hidden pockets on the inside. You can also use box bags and totes to carry makeup and toiletries, so now you have an excuse to make a bag out of that Star Wars Grogu Mandalorian print for your person who shaves. Or wears makeup. Or both. Magnifying lights. If you've watched a couple of my earlier antique crochet videos, you may have noticed I sometimes use a magnifying lamp. They're a fabulous idea for anyone working on small projects, but also for folks who are getting a little bit older and want to minimize eye strain. My lamp was a gift from my parents, but you can find similar lamps on Amazon for less than $100. Mine uses a standard ring light, which makes that part easy to replace in case of damage or wear. If you want something a little bit more high-end, however, Otlight makes some really cool lamps. For instance, they have a floor lamp that also has an attached magnifier and a place to plug in your tablet or phone. With more crafters using PDF patterns or just wanting to watch a show on Netflix while they work, having a spare power port is extremely handy. Ott also has magnifying lights you can mount on your sewing machine if threading your needle or following your seam guide is becoming more of a challenge, as well as hands-free magnifiers you can balance on your neck and chest for hand sewists. I'm not sponsored by Ott, I just think they're headed in the right direction as far as products geared to the current aging demographic of crafters. The big knitting boom hit a lot of 30-somethings in the late 90s to early 2000s, and some of the early adopters are well into their 50s or 60s and staring down retirement. I definitely recommend shopping around and making comparisons. Socks, scarves, shawls, toques, and mitts. If you're a knitter or a crocheter, you might want to treat one or more members of your friend or family group with a warm woolly item. I make socks for our family elders each year, but sometimes I have a little extra bandwidth to make mittens or hats. There's the odd shawl or scarf that crops up here and there. It depends on who you're crafting for and whether you've had any special requests. Of all these items, I'd say that standard winter toques or beanies are the fastest to knit. 
With mittens possibly coming in a close second, you can use a larger gauge yarn and needles and still have a warm set for cold winter nights. The smaller your gauge of yarn and needles, the more effort and time you have to put in, so factor that in when doing yarn crafts on a deadline. That said, an item handmade by you is a precious gift of your time, skill, and materials. Don't feel that because you can make gifts, that you have to make gifts, or that you have to make things for others on demand. You get to choose the people who are worthy of receiving a handmade present. One of the first things I learned to do as a crafter was to say no. You don't have to say it with any kind of malice, you just have to set a boundary. It's come in handy in the past when co-workers saw me knitting on a lunch break and tried to solicit anything from sweaters and scarves to quilts and Christmas ornaments. Sometimes not even for themselves. You, my friend, are not H&M, Old Navy, or winners. If they want to pay $5 for a scarf and mitts, there are better ways to go about it. Just remember, if you've said no and someone is still pressuring you to knit, crochet, or sew for them, they're the jerk, not you. They're overstepping when you've made it clear you're not interested. The best thing to do at that point is to walk away, though if you're more entertained by thoughts of vengeance, I recommend finding the scratchiest discount acrylic you can find and charge them for buttery soft merino. They won't be asking again. Boop the like button if you're a scratchy acrylic vengeance demon. Or let me know in the comments your tales of entitled craft requests. I'm curious, and I enjoy Instagram accounts like Can You Sew This For Me with its tales of unsolicited trouser repairs and unwarranted requests for curtain swagging. Gifts for crafters. Alrighty, time for a few craft specific gift recommendations. If you're already into these crafts, you may have some of these items already. Or maybe not. You might want to put them on your wish list, or maybe you have a friend or a loved one who wants to try something new and doesn't know where to start. Remember, there's no shame in giving or asking for a gift card, especially if it's for a place you know that gift card will be used. Here we go. Sewing. Sewing is always a bit of a grab bag, mostly because there are so many different things that people like to sew. Someone who's into historical costuming might not be into the same things as a quilter. That said, there's always a bit of crossover. Small projects might be the answer. As mentioned previously, there are pocket kits available on Etsy. Another wonderful small project is a husif, or housewife. These are basically historic, aesthetic sewing kits. Willoughby and Rose sell physical kits with all of the fabric and trims necessary to make a husif, as well as digital PDF patterns for those who already have a sizable stash. This is one of those gifts that's not only fun to make, but also makes a nice present. Bonus points if you ransack your own scraps and stash for your themed husif or pockets. Some folks get really persnickety about things like shears and rotary cutters, but almost everyone can use an extra tape measure. They make great stocking suffers, as do little decorative boxes or tins. You can fill those tins with replacement pins, clips, and tailor's chalk. If there's an interest in cross-stitch or embroidery, you can pick up a pre-made kit, such as one of the Dimensions cross-stitch kits. I tend to hoard these when I can get them. Dimensions had a bunch of wizard and sorceress kits in the early 2000s that my family gave me for my birthday and Yule gifts. Some of them had floss and fabric, and others just the pattern and charms. Nowadays you can get all sorts of kits that appeal to a variety of interests, including Star Wars cross-stitch. This poster hung in my bedroom when I was a kid, and now I can cross-stitch it. Samplers are also really in vogue at the moment. If pre-made kits aren't your thing, or you want to make a more bespoke gift for your gift recipient, there are some cool digital patterns available online for samplers. Long Dog Samplers and Modern Folk Embroidery both have extensive sampler patterns. Some simple, some complex. Pair that with some DMC floss and Ada cloth, and you have your own kit. You don't even need to use simple white cloth either. There are all sorts of new designs and colors to choose from. I think I've seen everything from cloud prints to blood splatters in my web searches, so definitely shop around, particularly if you want sparkles in your fabric. Yarn crafts. I'm lumping knitting and crochet together mostly because they're both yarn crafts. I know, how insensitive of me. Some of the tools and essentials are the same. It's just that one hobby uses needles and the other uses hooks. I've had family members ask what I want for Yule and get really tense when I just reply with, yarn. <laughs> See, they're worried about making a misstep. 
They don't want to insult your wool snob reputation with their acrylic budget. Or they don't want to give you sweater yarn if you're a sock knitter. And there's always the chance the recipient, either you or someone else, is allergic to the yarn in question. At that point, it's really important to either be very upfront as to the allergy or just ask for a gift card. Some folks find gift cards very impersonal, but it's the difference between yarn you're not going to use and have to offload elsewhere because you're allergic to it, or buying a new pair of nickel-plated knitting needles. That's a pretty significant difference in terms of use and cherishability. Is that even a word? If anyone's even interested, my family's main concern was color. They didn't want to give me sock yarn I wouldn't use because their color preferences might not line up with mine. So my policy is that if they buy me sock yarn, they give me colors they like. Because the chances are pretty good I'm going to use that yarn to knit for them. It really hasn't been a problem because I've had both the mums flat out make grabby hands when I started knitting a pair of socks for myself. Things like a ball winder and swift are wonderful gifts. Many knitters have a ball winder though, they're usually the less expensive plastic models meant for smaller balls of yarn. I'd suggest a larger model, possibly made of wood. They're generally sturdier, wind faster and smoother, and can handle the amount of yarn in one of those jumbo balls of acrylic that a lot of crocheters use. They're also a bit more useful for folks who like larger gauge yarn for making things like lopy sweaters. Really, yarn winders and swifts are the kind of present that you either have to specify as a yarn crafter or ask first slash be more observant if it's for a friend or family member. Yarn bowls are a wonderfully aesthetic way to display your yarn while you use it. Another option is a basket or bin that can go beside your yarn crafter's chair. It's nice to have a way to stay organized in the place you usually do your work. It helps not having to chase a ball of yarn across the living room. For stocking stuffers, I generally recommend stitch markers, tape measures, embroidery scissors, and extra needles or hooks. Many knitters use closed ring stitch markers and crocheters split ring or rings with closures. I generally use packets of stitch markers that can be opened and closed just in case I need to mark a specific stitch. Though I do enjoy the occasional closed ring decorative stitch marker. Variety, as they say, is the spice of life. Thing is, these are all things that yarn crafters often misplace or break. I've found stitch markers in the oddest places when moving furniture and have lost or broken more than one tape measure when moving from one purse to another. One of my favorite little doodads is a small plastic needle case with some often used needles. I have everything from small needles for weaving in ends to large needles used as bodkins. They're great for weaving ribbon or elastic into a small opening. Replacement knitting needles and crochet hooks can be expensive and crafters can be very particular about their tools. Some folks like wooden hooks, while others prefer metal with plastic handles. Some knitters prefer expensive nickel-plated needles. What's up with those jerks anyhow? So that's a stocking stuffer you might want to check first before you buy. You can buy complete sets for a reasonable price these days. Full hook sets, both with grips and without. Full interchangeable needle sets, both metal and wood. You can find a good variety through knit picks. Just, once again, remember that shipping time is a factor. Have I missed anything? I think that's it, at least for now. Feel free to keep the recommendations going in the comments, particularly if I've forgotten to include your favorite craft or hobby. I have some sewing I need to get done, so... Till then! <laughs>